Hello students, this is another R video. Here, what we want to do is compute the uh, Kolmogorov-Smirnov test statistic from a given sample. Of course, we do that in R. Now, just in a second, recall what this test statistic is doing. It's trying to test the, the hypothesis that the, the data, our sample, comes from a certain a specific distribution with CDF FX. And the test statistic is taking the, the maximum, so the, the, the very largest possible value of this thing, okay, the absolute difference between the CDF, the empirical CDF of the data and the CDF of the distribution under H0. So conceptually or qualitatively, if this is big, it means that the, the data is far away from the distribution under H0, and you would want to reject the, the null hypothesis. So what we'll do is simply derive this statistic in R. Uh, this is more as a, let's say, programming exercise to, to understand what, to really understand what this statistic is doing, but there's already an R function implemented. So in practice, you, you, you would use this R function, and also the R function is computing the p-values as well. So of course, you know that in statistics, finding the test, the yeah, finding the statistic itself is not enough. You need it to have a, a p-value or, or, or at least a critical region. So we're not going to focus on finding the critical region. It's actually a bit complicated. So we just find a statistic, and this is this is more as a programming exercise, but then we use the, the, the p-values given by the R function to actually conduct the test. So let's do that. So now jumping to R. So... Uh, as usual, we're going to do this in a, in a function. So I'm calling this uh, KS statistic. It's going to be a function that computes the KS statistic for a given sample. Now, this function is, is going to have the first argument is, is our data, so a sample. This would be, a, in R, it would be a vector of all our observations. CDF is the distribution under H0, and it, it needs to be a function defined in either in R already or that you define yourself. So we're going to see an example of both situation where CDF is already a function in R or one that we create ourselves. And param, well, param is a vector of the parameters of this distribution because you see the test statistic needs to be computed for a specific. It's not enough to say, okay, I want to test uh, that it's normal. You need to specify a normal with which parameters. Now, just as a comment here, this is not as general as you would like it assumes that the CDF has two parameters. Uh, so, so param should be a vector with two values that are used here. Param one is the first parameter, mu for normal, and param two is a, a second parameter, uh, sigma for normal. Um, so it's not as general as you would like, but of course you can easily adapt this code to, to fit a, a distribution CDF with only one parameter or three parameter or four and so on. And you would just adapt here, have, have param one, param two, param three, param four, based on how many you, you, you have in your specific CDF here. Now, uh, it's not too, the code here is not too difficult, but maybe actually uh, seeing on a picture what we're trying to do might help. So let me just show you a little plot I made earlier, just for you. So this is the illustration of what what we're doing. The, 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 is this pink? The pink curve, it, it, it would be the, the CDF under H0, so a theoretical CDF. So it's, it's, you see it's smooth. And then Fn is the empirical CDF. And the empirical CDF uh, then has jumps, has jumps of size exactly uh, 1 over n. Uh, and you know it's, it's um, here I put the, this is just an illustration, right? But I put x bracket one, meaning the, the first test statistic. So this x1 would be the, the very uh, the very smallest observation in our data. The empirical CDF Fn before that is zero because it's the probability to be smaller than x1 is zero. There's no data point smaller than x1. And at exactly x1, there's a jump because there's exactly one observation smaller or equal to x1, which is x1. Okay, and then at x2, it, it, there's a jump again of size one over n because there's exactly two observations that are smaller or equal to um, uh, x2. So here, the height of this bar would be would be 2 over n, and so on. So you see, fn is a, it's a step function. 
But our mission is to find the the very largest difference between those two those two functions, the the blue one and the and the pink one. The only slightly tricky part is that, so it, it is that we need to check the the distance between the the um, pink curve and the blue one before and after the jumps. Okay, so it suffices to check at every one of the uh, observed data points, but we need to check. Uh, before and after the job. And what I mean is, look for this specific example. The the, the distance between the, the pink one and the function just before the jump is kind of small, but you see it's bigger. The distance between the, the, the pink one and the blue one is bigger just after the jump. So here, and for this specific observation, that's the biggest uh, gap. And here, that's also the biggest gap, the, the, the distance between the function, the blue function after ju the jump and the pink one. You know, you, I mean, this this green arrow is bigger than the equivalent distance uh, here. But if you look further for for the the fourth uh, largest observation here, the distance between the pink one and the blue one, of course, this distance is bigger just before the jump. So if you evaluate the function at you know uh, x four minus a tiny quantity, okay, the distance between the blue and the pink is bigger than than at x four you know, after the jump, because then, of course, the distance between this and this uh, is small. Hopefully that's clear. So now we do that in, in R. Find all those distances and then, then take the very maximum. And that's our test statistic. So n is just the size of the sample. You use function length in R. Fn. As I said, the jumps are always of size one over n. So every so, um, so so the so the, the you you would have the 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 function after each jump is going to be all the values one over n, two over n, three over n, and the last one is n over n, which is one. Okay, if, uh, this this syntax does create the integers one, two, three up to n. Now the value of this blue uh, step function right before the jumps would be just uh, one over n minus um, of what we had before. So you, you know the first one is zero, and then the the very last one is n minus one over n. Okay, so that's what I call f n minus, uh, which which of course is a vector. Uh, we can just check what what it looks like for n equals ten. Uh, f minus is this okay, is zero, zero point one, zero point two, up to zero point nine. Okay, and of course f n is this. Now f x. I evaluate simply my density, my sorry, my CDF at every observation. At every observation. So I take CDF. What is CDF? It's whatever I've declared it here as an argument. So I take the CDF at every point now. Careful. I I I need the, the, the order statistics. So remember, I need x bracket one, which is the smallest, x bracket two, which is the second one, the second smallest, and then so on. So you take sort of the sample. Sort of a sample, you get what you want. So you evaluate the CDF at, at x1 and x2, blah, blah, blah. You plug the parameters. So you see, imagine that CDF was a was a um, p norm. Well, you, you have p norm of all your observations, but specifically for a, a mean of whatever you specified in the param and the standard deviation of whatever you sp specify. That's fx, and we're almost done. Now we, we're taking the very maximum between what? Between what? The absolute value of fn minus fx. So that's the distances after the jump at every evaluate at every uh, uh, order statistic, and then you take the absolute value of f n minus. So that's the distance, uh, you know, f s f n minus minus f x. That is the, there's a distance between the function right before the jump and the uh, well and f and the theoretical f x. Uh, Hopefully that's uh, relatively clear. And so here taking the maximum. So here you, this is a vector of values. This is another vector of value. You take the very maximum, take the very maximum. And that's it. You compute your uh, test statistic. Now I declare the function. Then now I'm just going to uh, try it. Try it. Um, now I want to try it with a CDF that's already implemented in R. I'm going to use P norm, but I also want to make sure it works for a CDF that I would create myself. So I'm going to reuse an example we've done before. So in a previous video, we had we had created the the, the Pareto p Pareto would be the CDF of a Pareto with um, those two arguments. Then, uh, as before, I vectorize it, and then so let's see. Here I'm going to generate 
a sample from a normal a sample. This is arbitrary of size 100. Again, arbitrary, but let's have a mean of one and standard deviation of two. Okay, so that's a sample of size 100. Now, if I compute my uh, Kolmogorov st test statistic, so you see, I would I would get the statistic. Okay, what's the maximum distance between the the, the empirical CDF of my sample and the theoretical CDF, which is a normal. So P norm is already a function that exists in R. I give it, and here I give it the, the, the right parameters. So here, my point is just that this shouldn't be too, too big because I'm actually checking against the right distribution. So you see, if we try, we get something that's uh, not too big. Now, I mean, big or small is relative. Here, we have a sample of size only 100. So you see, this is not that that close to zero, I suppose. But because the, the sample size is 100, uh, this distance is not too big. If I check here now, I'm checking the same sample, but against a distribution that's totally off. It's completely false. Okay, the Pareto, of course, doesn't even have a negative support. So here, the distance. My point is just qualitatively, this distance now should be should be bigger. And by the way, I'm just giving parameters here. They're, they're not pick arbitrarily. You can check that those are parameters that create for the Pareto a mean of one and a standard deviation of two. Okay, uh, and then so if we do that. Yes, we get something that's that's substantially bigger. Now, of course, again, this is all kind of uh, how 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 big is too big. When will we reject? Now, to 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 get the p value and to know if we reject or not the null hypothesis, then we use the inbuilt um, R function, which is uh, that's the name of the R function. Key as dot test, and, and and this also allows us to to validate that our code over there uh, was right because the, the the value of the test statistic should be the same. So let's see. Uh, so again, this is a function that already exists in R. It has the following um, um, syntax. I give it my sample. So this was a sample I created before. I give it the distribution I want to test for. So what's the distribution under H0? Uh, P norm. Okay, let's let's try with P norm. Again, the correct distribution. Again, this same thing, I pass the arguments, uh, or, or if you prefer, the parameters of the normal I'm, I'm checking for, one and two. So you see, this is the right distribution. So uh, the test should not should not reject because uh, we would reject if we don't have the right distribution or if, if our data doesn't conform to, to the distribution I've specified here. So here you see, I get what I what I what I expected. Well, first of all, we have the our test statistic is the, the same as we computed here. It looks like it, and the p value you see is big, so we would not reject. We we would not reject that the data was generated under a, a normal uh, one two. Uh, but now let's try if I, if I'm if I'm if I'm testing the hypothesis that the data comes from a Pareto. Now Pareto is very is terrible choice here, so I, I probably should be rejecting. So let's see. Uh, yes, p value is very small. So here I haven't given you a level of significance, but with any you know reasonable level of significance, use five percent, use one percent. P value is smaller than that, so you would you would reject. You would reject. Uh, and the value is zero point twenty seven. Is it what we had before? I hope so. Yes, that's also what we computed. It seems to work. Now, just as a small comment, here is an argument: exact equals true. So, um, if you want to have more more information about this uh, KS, KS test, you can uh, ask R for the for the information. But there's a way to compute exact uh, p values. Other than that, if we if we try, let's try get with with false. Uh, R would use um. Uh, I suppose there's a there's an asymptotic approximation, uh, which I imagine in most cases would be would be reasonable, but you 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 would get slightly different values. So this one, that's the p value we got. If we try now with um, the the exact equals false, meaning it would be an it would be an asymptotic distribution. You see, the conclusion the conclusion of course doesn't change, but the value of the the, the p value changes a bit, right? Same thing here. Uh, p value before we had 0 0.57 or something. So you see it's slightly different. Now, this is not massively important, but I would just say, why not use, if if, if the exact is available, why not use exact? The, the only thing is that I, I'm guessing that if the sample size is very, very large, maybe the exact method uh, is going to take longer to compute, I, I imagine, rather than the um, the approximate um, uh, asymptotic distribution. I mean, maybe we can try. If, if we have a sample of size, 10,000, if we try to run the Kolmogorov te uh, test with exact equals true, uh, yeah, I think it, it took a fraction of a second, it still works, still works. Okay, so why not use exact equals true then? Try, try with the 100,000. 
then okay now you see it's 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 uh, taking longer which i suppose makes sense um okay one last thing so we're almost done one last thing i suppose this is almost like a side note but why not mention it to you there's another version of the uh, Kolmogorov Smirnov, Smirnov test. Uh, sorry for my Russian pronunciation; it's not really on point. Uh, there's another version of the test which is called um, two sample. Uh, here, I think, yeah, two sample uh, test. It, it, it can be useful. So let, let's just see what it does. You see, before I was testing the hypothesis that my my data in sample comes from a specific parametric distribution I've given. You could use this test also to check if a first sample that you have has the same distribution as another sample. Okay, so now you're not checking that your first sample has a certain parametric distribution. You're checking if it has the same distribution as another collected sample. Okay, so that would have an easy um, uh, implementation here. Let's first let's first declare another sample so I'm declare another sample and by the way this could be of any size okay it doesn't have to be the same size so let's let's have a size of 200 now so that's a different uh normal but you see it has you know the same distribution because it's also generated under a normal uh, as my first sample over there okay no, a normal with mean one okay let's regenerate it under a size of 100 like we had before so you see uh, you have two different normal okay so here I'm just feeding to KS test the first sample, the second sample, and again, why not have the exact uh, exact computation for the p value? Let's try. Okay, so you see it, the hypothesis is not rejected. So here it's plausible that they come from the same distribution, which is indeed the case because I myself generated them. If you if also and, and let's try just uh, exact equal false, you see I get something very very similar. One last thing. Let's generate another sample under a, a, a different, uh, a different um, a random variable. Let's say, uh, let's say again a normal, but with uh, different parameters. So now here I would expect to reject because they're quite uh, the, the sample come from quite different distributions. Uh, okay. Yes, I reject a very small p value, and using the the approximate uh, computation of p values, same thing. Okay, you see it's a bit different, but the conclusion is of course the same. And that's about all I want. All I wanted to say for the uh, KS test. Um, and so thanks, uh, thanks for watching. Um, I'll see you soon in the next video, or maybe in the lecture. <laughs>